Okay, hello. Uh, Analog Electronics Lecture 3, <coughs> all about interference. Uh, by that I mean electrical noise both being emitted and received within a circuit, which is going to cause trouble um, with, our, with our information being transmitted around, around our electronic system. So, uh, uh, roughly three areas that I want to talk about, not necessarily in this order, uh, about electrical interference, so actual electrons shooting around causing problems, electromagnetic interference, so in other words radio waves, and we'll talk about more detail about why they happen and, and how, um, and, and then also obviously how we defend against interference of all types. So, I mean, the first one I want to talk about, in some ways it's not interference, but it's very much part of this subject, is and something I hope that you're all aware of and familiar with, is the dangers of electrostatic sensitivity. So that's, in other words, where we've got static electricity that's built up due to our shoes rubbing on this nylon carpet, all sorts of things like that, anywhere where then we can discharge this charged hand of mine into any object, and if that object happens to be a sensitive piece of electronics, it can badly damage it. And we've here some very interesting examples of damage that can happen at these microscopic levels that we can have in modern electronics. So, a few things to, to, to be aware of there. Obviously, we're all familiar with the idea it damages and destroys electronics. Uh, but it's, it's worth noting that, as, as you can see here, modern gate geometries are so small now that intuitively you can imagine <coughs> that they're more susceptible because they're smaller structures on those, on those electronic circuits, easier to punch holes in with fewer electrons and things like that. But some, some of the things that people don't realise necessarily is you don't even need to actually touch the thing for some very sensitive electronics, just the very electrostatic field emanating from that static electricity is enough to damage a piece of electronics potentially, just by bringing your hand close to it when it's not earth. <coughs> so there's a danger <coughs> that I was unaware of until a while ago. And the other, the other problem, this can be a real problem, is the fact that it doesn't necessarily destroy the electronics straight away, it can weaken the structures. So here we can see, for example, something that might be ready to break. We've got a tiny, a tiny contact, uh, contacting area still touching. So there's a little time bomb waiting to go off. So very important to look out for electrostatic problems like that. Uh, little jargon buster there just to fill in the, the points about what I, what I put there. What is electrostatic discharge? And, uh, and this idea of silicon geometries. And, and it's quite useful to know roughly what the state of the art is these days, extraordinarily small structure sizes. But yeah, going back to, to, to the point was all about, well, electrostatics and how do we avoid them. And I hope this is something you've already come across in your electronics careers. Very important to firstly uh, earth yourself, so those, those electrons that have, w have built up on your hand uh, get soaked away down to ground, so the old, the old static wrist strap, and if you're working for a long period of time, we should be using uh, a, a, an anti-static workstation, so you can see this ground, ground mat here to try and soak soak the electrons off our shoes, off our hands on this workbench and then wearing a, a wrist strap as well as we work. And then when, when we're away from the bench, important to, to use anti-static packaging. You know, so this is something that's pretty familiar, I hope, to you, this sort of metalised plastic bags that people put, people put sensitive electronics in for transport and also these boxes with metalised foams and things like that and the ubiquitous um, the warning labels that you often see on computers and things like that. So as you can see there, there's various techniques for hardening el uh, electronics against, against anti-static and all sorts of other things as well, but as always, prevention better than cure. 
So, beyond anti-static, perhaps more importantly in, for, the ter for this lecture, I want to talk a, quite, in quite some detail about uh, EMC, as it's known, electromagnetic compatibility. So, what's that? That's where we are unintentionally generating and transmitting electromagnetic energy. Um, <clears throat> So obviously some circuits are deliberately trying to do it if we've got a radio transmitter. So the last thing we want to do is create unintentional radio waves. It's worth mentioning that we can also talk about no, uh, noise as well being transmitted along electrical lines as well. But I want to concentrate just for the moment more on <coughs> EMC. <coughs> so there's two parts to that. It's firstly, we shouldn't be creating any inadvertent e emissions. And secondly, where when there are inevitably emissions coming out of other equipment or, as you can see here, the very environment that things operating in, <coughs> we, don't, we want to defend against that and, and find out ways of preventing. So I, I, put a, I put a little jargon buster for electromagnetic energy here, which you hope you're familiar with. <coughs> so I've just <coughs> summarised it up there. But I think here's a useful point that I've added here is we get the electromagnetic radiation generated whenever a charged particle is accelerated. So in other words, a change of speed. So that should give us a clue as whenever a current changes, we're accelerating electrons. So inevitably, we're going to be creating electromagnetic radiation uh, because of the very fundamental physics of electrons. So interference. It's important to understand just how ubiquitous it is, actually. Um, it's very easy to think of it, oh, well, it's something that's out there in the outside world, sure, when there's uh, avionics and things like that have a terrible time with uh, interference from the environment. But perhaps one of the most electromagnetically hostile environments for any piece of electronics is funny enough, right under, just under the bonnet of a car. So, in fact, the automotive industry <coughs> it's incredibly skilled at dealing with these electromagnetic interference issues. <coughs> and the consumer industry is, has its own problems as well because it's got all these very high speed electronics tightly packed into small, uh, small devices. So we get a big problem in the consumer industry with, electro with interference between different subcomponents within a uh, within a unit of some sort. So it's everywhere. Not just aeroplanes being struck by lightning and things like that. So watch out. So what do we get from it? Well, usually, <coughs> usually if we're lucky, <coughs> the worst that's going to happen is what we see here <coughs> is some temporary noise on our signal, we're all familiar with that, the sort of d um, uh, digital TV signals uh, pixelating out during bad weather and things like that because the interference from the environment or a reduced signal such that the noise in the environment suddenly becomes significant. So if we're lucky we just get momentary corruption of data uh, that isn't going to cause any lasting effect in the system, but you can imagine for some systems if we get corrupted data that can cause a disaster in itself. So going back to that point I made earlier about, don't forget, electromagnetic radiation is, is generated by a change in the speed of movement of our electrons, so in other words change of current flow. Well, what does that mean? That means faster rise times of our square waves, of our information, mean more electromagnetic radiation. So just harking back to that point I made in the very first lecture about we should only make our electronics as fast as they need to be. And similarly, remember we talked about this really nasty piece of design here, <coughs> about this rather unfortunate long track all the way around this PCB creating induction inductive and capacitive effects. Well, you can also imagine that acts like a very nice, handy, large antenna, both in transmitting and receiving of electromagnetic radiation. So we can accidentally send glitches out into the environment. We can also pick up other people's glitches as well. So there's an yet another reason why we need to think about keeping our designs small and tight 
uh, to, in order to prevent these interference effects as well. So a particular case of that sort of interference is what's often known as crosstalk, and you'll hear about this a lot, and we've we had a look at it in some of the labs. <coughs> a particular instance of it where essentially a, a long wire that we're trying to use to transmit our information is emitting radiation and the wire right next to it is acting as another aerial to pick up that that noise. And so here we go. This is a very good picture here I found. A sharp edge. So that, that fast rise time that is causing a glitch on the associated data lines in that same transmission bus. And so our good old ribbon cable is an absolute shocker for that sort of thing. So we can see this, this picture in the middle here is, is very helpful in that you can see a, ri a sharp rise in the, in the value here is causing a momentary glitch on this quote victim trace on the other side. So just to go on about it in more detail, uh, again, yet again, keep your edges as slow as possible. It's very tempting to think, oh, we'll just switch the electronics as fast as we possibly can, and we'll use the fastest rise times that we can possibly generate, uh, because that will make things safe. Not necessarily. It can come back at you with these interference effects. So beware. And so we're trying to reduce the emissions that we ever create. So it goes back to this point about prevention is better than cure. Instead of trying to intercept interference and work around it, which we need to try and avoid it happening in the first place as much as possible. Particularly with the types of interference where we're interfering with ourselves and the components within our own devices. Because they're at particularly close range. And so the, the signal strength is going to be bad. <coughs> So because of all this, there's become a, a very clear awareness of, of these um, electromagnetic compatibility issues in the last sort of 20 years, really. And so <coughs> <coughs> huge amounts of money get spent these days <coughs> on, on testing of emissions and susceptibilities and there are these huge test houses where people can put entire aeroplanes and cars inside these quote anechoic chambers so these are these uh, electrically silent chambers that allow us to perform testing across all different frequencies here and so people can generate transmitted interference in order to see whether our devices are susceptible and we can also sit there and listen on all sorts of different spectra. Uh, and the typical example of this is a car or, a or, a, or an aircraft being tested. The thing to bear in mind about EMC testing these, these in these sort of facilities, it's very expensive. Uh, and so you tend to try and make absolutely certain that your device is neither susceptible nor interference prone long before you go anywhere near a test house and you hope that your device passes first time. So there's various pieces of test equipment that can be used on a bench in your own laboratory to, to verify that the device is electrically silent before you go in and start spending huge amounts of money at these vast test houses. So, oh, anechoic chamber, sorry, yes very useful device, uh, very useful chambers so we can confirm that nothing's coming in or out so everything within that room is to do with our experiment. <coughs> so EMI testing as everything these days has been enshrined in European standards and so if you look on any piece of consumer or industrial equipment these days Look closely and you'll find this quote CE mark, Conformité Européenne. Now the CE mark actually refers to all sorts of different standards that have been passed uh, to do with things like uh, uh, safety of whether it's got sharp edges and things like that right through to whether it can operate properly in human environments and things. But for electronics equipment, particularly important part of the CE mark is demonstrating that it's conformant to the electromagnetic standards um, 
And now those standards differ depending on the environment in which the device is intended to be used. So, for, uh, for example, there will be one standard for our iPhone here, which has been used in the domestic and commercial environment. But more beefier standards apply and more to the harsher environments that our industrial equipment might be expected to survive in. And there's other, and there's other standards that refer to making sure that we don't accidentally broadcast on our radio frequencies on stuff that we're, apt, that we're deliberately trying to transmit, uh, frequencies we're deliberately trying to transmit on. So look out for your CE mark. <coughs> it's been around for about 20 years now. And it, it's a pretty woolly description of conformity, but it's still useful. Now, this is a slide, the form of this slide, I, I showed in the very first lecture, so I, I just want to revisit it again, as well as electromagnetic waves. They're these charged particles that come flying down out of space. And in the, uh, if you're lucky, it can cause transient glitches by chiseling through our silicon crystal and accidentally ionizing them and switching the gate on. So, although it's not quite like EMC, uh, e uh, electromagnetic radiation. It's another form of ionizing radiation that can cause these devices to corrupt. And again, the same point stands as, as time's gone on and these devices have become smaller and smaller. Intuitively, you can imagine, they're more electronically fragile. And so smaller devices are more and more susceptible to these sort of effects. And so single event failures are just just as um, common in small geometries as electromagnetic corruption. Now something I didn't show in the previous slide about single event failures <coughs> is they can have a, a darker side as well. They can actually physically damage the crystal as well and particularly the dopants in there. And so here what's called lattice displacement which is actually physically displacing the, the, the very dopants in the crystal of our semiconductor device and so we're causing actual physical damage and hence actual changes to the analogue properties of our switching CMOS gate or any other technology we might choose to use and it's permanent because as you can see we've actually physically damaged the, 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 the structure of that crystal that we're relying on to process our information. <coughs> so, we're all familiar with grounding, and as well as, and that has a double effect of having having good zero earths around our circuit, and helping to take back the electri uh, the electricity from our equipment after it's been switched, and it also has other effects as well. It helps to soak up the electromagnetic radiation and give more noise immunity and electromagnetic immunity. And so it's very easy to think that ground planes, well, it's this beautiful sink of electrons. <coughs> <coughs> but it's important to understand the limitations of ground planes as well, because guess what? Even ground planes are frequency dependent. It's sort of message that keeps coming back over and over again, frequency and too much of it can cause all sorts of problems because you get this really bizarre effect and this, I think these two pictures sum it up very nicely that if we've got a nice steady current flow through our circuit the current distributes its flow back through the ground plane the current distributes itself nice and evenly as the switching frequency goes up I don't want to go into too much detail about the physics of it but the, frequent, but the inductive effect causes the electrons to hog their way around a small part of the, a narrow channel in that ground plane. So, and therefore you can see as the frequency goes up, we're sort of negating the benefit of our ground plane as the electrons bunch together in the, uh, inside the, uh, along a particular path in the ground plane. So ground planes, wonderful things. So as you can see here, clearly a much more reliable form of distributing a, a ground signal compared to our, ni our, our nice little bit of old breadboard here uh, and, and providing a nice sort of electronic shield, as you can imagine, around the circuit. But yeah, just be aware 
that even a, a, a fully spread out ground plane can have its own limits. So the other side of the ground plane is the power supply. <laughs> That's uh, ground plane soaks it up, power supply puts our power into our, our current into our device at a certain voltage. <coughs> and it's very easy to think of a battery as some sort of perfect voltage device <coughs> uh, that can just deliver any amount of current and give a perfect uh, voltage at all times. So uh, I, prob I, hope, I hope it's fairly obvious to you already that that's probably not the case. In reality, a power supply can usually start delivering reasonably well, uh, but then it will start to tail off as, as it reaches the limits of its capability. And usually that's because of inevitable internal resistances within these devices. So you can see this one here has got a fairly constant resistance. <coughs> <coughs> However, this one is, is very nonlinear, and this is because we've got a regulating effect which can cope with uh, up to 2 amps in this instance, but after that the, the, the capability rolls off as the regulation it runs out of steam. So remember that your power supplies aren't perfect. As we, as we demand more of them, the voltage can start to droop and that can cause all sorts of effects. Go back to our point last week about how we need a good, no uh, we need a good margin above the switching signals of our digital device. That's obviously going to erode that as that voltage drops. And now the, and the problem is going to be here that the, the load the current load is it could easily be data dependent, so the very, the very act of computation that we're working on could affect how sensitive the device is to this power supply droop and thus how, it, and thus how sensitive it's going to be to noise in the circuit and things like that. And it, and ultimately, it could droop so far that the device doesn't even switch properly and it fails even with no noise going on. So it's a form of interference where the very information in the circuit could potentially affect the, beha the, the behavior and the data integrity within that circuit. So there's a dangerous one to be aware of. So it's, this, is another, this is really a restatement of that previous point I was making, the idea of current hogging. So if we've got a whole load of devices hanging off our single power supply, uh, depending on what those different devices are doing, some of them might steal more current than the uh, than another. So no, they call it current hogging, and so and so that's a dangerous game because, as I say, again, it's going to be context specific, and it's particularly important if we're mixing power switching and information switching. So that goes back to our point from from the first lecture about electrical effects versus electronic. When we've got electrical switching mixed off the same power supply as electronic switching, we can get into a dangerous situation. So let me think of an example. A microwave oven where we're, where we're using electrical power to power the, the, the actual cooking of the, of the device. But on the same, in the same machine, we've got a microprocessor handling the control and the user interface of our microwave oven. And so you can imagine it would be very easy for when we turn the power up on our electrical subsystem for it to hog power away from our electronics, which could cause data corruption, all sorts of things like that. <laughs> and be aware, again, context specific. So um, you've got to think of your worst case scenario if you can. So those are, those are all the dreadful things that can go wrong, really. And so how can we, what can we do to try and mitigate these effects? So uh, I've done a quick list here. Um, <coughs> really going from the, from, from the complete stick of, stick of Band-Aid over the problem through to more sophisticated solutions in defending against electrical and EM radiation in our, in our systems. <clears throat> so as you can see here, 
first thing we can do is stick a shield around it, stick a piece of metal around it. <coughs> and that's the first thing we all think of is if we've got a long piece of wire, we put we put a metalized shield around it so here we can see our aluminized wrapping insula uh, layer on our cable and, s and we can also if you take the back off your iPhone or something like that you'll see little shields like that to try and contain the electromagnetic radiation being emitted by say the phone transmitter in your shield in order to defend uh, against that radiation leaking out and, and corrupting the actual control electronics within that phone. And guess what? Shielding is also frequency dependent. Look at this. Essentially these different materials and different shaped structures are capable of soaking up uh, electromagnetic radiation <coughs> better at certain frequencies due to resonance effects. So I don't want to go into the physics too deeply. But you can see here, this is a very good example here. Oh my word, what's going on here? So the shielding can fall off a cliff, especially at high frequencies. As, 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 as d and more and more frequencies that your device emits will, will more and more increase the probability of, of something getting through that shielding that you've provided. So again, shielding very much a sticking plaster over the basic problem of try not to emit in the first place. Now if you're building a phone that's trying to radio out there, then yeah, there's nothing you can do. That's what you're trying to do. But you should try and not uh, in unintentionally emit. So a slightly more sophisticated form of shielding really is filtering. <coughs> and you'll tend to see this stuff on all sorts of inputs of devices coming in, you'll see it on leads and stuff like that, so a good example here are these ferrite filters that you often see clamped around the end of a, things like a USB lead and things like that. So what a filter generally is trying to do is exploiting the fact that uh, noise and interference is usually at a high frequency but certainly at a frequency away from the ones that we want to transmit our information at and so we can put filters in to pick off at certain frequencies that will that we know are, are going to be noisy. And a, there's different kinds of filters, so, so there's passive inactive, so in other words a passive filter is just something that doesn't require any power supply to it. It's generally a, a resistor or a capacitor or an inductor or something like that, just sits there filtering the device. You can also make an active filter built on an op amp or something like that, some sort of amplifier stage. So it actively boosts the, fre boosts the frequencies that we're interested in and suppresses the, the noise frequencies that we know about. And we can have uh, what's called a choke or a shunt. You'll hear this bit of jargon probably spoken about, and so I've just put that in a quick jargon buster there. A choke quite simply, uh, sorry, a shunt quite simply is a is a, de a device, a filter that's gone in series, uh, in parallel with the device that it's defending. So in other words, it, it, sh it shunts the noise around the device instead of letting it go into the device. A choke is just something that's in series that prevents that noise getting in in the first place. <coughs> so shunt is parallel, choke is series. And different reasons why one is good depending on what kind of frequencies you're trying to block and what from, things like that. So I want to talk particularly about a very specific case of filtering and this is something that you'll come across and I hope you've already come across as a digital designer is the idea of decoupling capacitor and a decoupling capacitor is quite simply a, a shunt capacitor put across an electronic device in order to shunt high frequency, unwanted high frequency noise away from the internals of that device. And if you look closely on a piece of electronics, any well designed electronics will have a, a decoupling capacitor, the shunt filter fitted to almost every individual electronic device. And in fact, you can even buy, and these are really good, I've found in the past, you know, these are these sockets with the uh, decoupling capacitor 
already installed and integrated in. <coughs> so you can see what we're trying to do here is, pro is, is provide this decoupling capacitor as physically close to the ground, to the, to the power and ground pins of our device as possible. So it's very easy to think of, oh well, we could put the resist, uh, we could put the decoupling capacitor some distance away, it wouldn't matter, but no, we know now that even short amounts of wire, there'll be resistant, there'll be tiny amounts of resistance, capacitance and inductance in that in that length. And we want to minimize that to to boost the the usefulness of this filter. So decoupling capacitors, I hope you've come across those in the past and I hope you'll use them in the future. And people have different levels of decoupling at different positions on their board. So here's an example here. Uh, 1000 microfarads is quite a big one in my experience. But yes, I can imagine that. Uh, right down to these tiny numbers that are fitted to the individual devices. Decoupling capacitors. So, another, another good way of, of trying to isolate devices, uh, sorry, no, of trying to prevent noise propagation and interference propagation is actually physically isolating the things. What do I mean by that? So in other words, actually having an air, a physical air gap between one set of circuitry and another. And how, how do we transmit our information across that, uh, across, that uh, across that gap? And there's basically two ways generally used. One, we can send our information as photons by having an LED and a photodiode on one side. Or we can send it as uh, inductive electromagnetic field uh, across a transformer. And so we're, gener we're creating an air gap though. So two completely different de sets of devices using completely different power supplies potentially are uh, with the information being passed across them in order to decouple the, uh, these electrical devices. And, and we can get these, these transformers or these LED photodiode combinations completely boxed up in nice standalone components like these, usually known as things like opto-isolators and transformer isolators and things like that. So it's a bit like saying, right, in order to isolate ourselves, we can send a radio signal to a receiver at some place elsewhere. And that's pretty much what's actually going on. So another final trick is that's often used in transmission lines is the concept of differential transmission. And that's where we, we say, OK, we, we accept that we're going to get interference on our transmitted line. We've done everything we can to get rid of it. But we can exploit the fact that when, when interference does tend to happen, it often tends to happen equally on two adja physically adjacent wires. So if we transmit our information uh, down both wires, and then we look at the difference of them at the far end, any glitch that occurs, it will tend to occur on both of these wires. So if we just invert and add those signals in an analog fashion, you'll notice, that glitch will tend to cancel out because we'll have the same shape and magnitude glitch on both wires. So a very useful trick and in fact there's a, there's a standard out there called RS422, you've probably heard of RS232, which is the old, old one, but the RS422 is a lower voltage but it's actually a more noise immune uh, protocol because it has this differential transmission trick. It's also worth noting there's a there's various aerospace protocols out there as well, such as one called ARINC 429, and they pull this same differential transmission trick. Very good way of quite rejecting noise. So in other words, we're not avoiding it, but at least we're we're using one of its properties to try and reject that noise at an analog level. So that's it. Let's just have a quick summary. I think the thing that keeps coming back is fast switching. Now, that by fast switching, I mean both the rate, the frequencies that we're switching at, and also the rise times that we and the sharpness of those edges that we're transmitting. So we only make our we only transmit our information 
and switch our devices at the speed that we have to to achieve the, the, the throughput that we're trying to get to. Anything less than that, we're going to start generating interference, more interference than we have to. And so we should avoid that. And as, we, as we've seen in the labs, capacitance and inductance together cause oscillations. And so that's, elect that's accelerating electrons oscillations. So that's going to cause our interference as well. So we're creating a spring which creates oscillation, which creates electromagnetic radiation, which cause, creates noise and interference. So, our, our old enemies, frequency, capacitance, and inductance are up, are up there again. Yeah, frequency matters. It's important to always remember and fast switching. So, as with all things in life, prevention is better than cure. So, for these, when we're designing our circuits, we look to firstly eliminate as much electromagnetic emission as possible and then we seek to defend against what, the, what inevitable emissions do occur. So two important lessons, two sides of the same argument during our design process. Thanks a lot. Any questions, please get in touch and see you soon.